podcast episode, episode five with myself, Cole Jurek, and Joe Blackmore. Today's special guest, Tony Satter. How are we doing? Doing great, man. Thanks for having me on. We're happy to have you. So we've, uh, like we were just kind of talking before Cole brought us live, we've had Billy on, Carlton, Kyle, uh, and now we get to jump back in time a little bit. And <laughs> I'm pretty excited about getting to know your story as a bison and just, I guess, to start it off, you know, you're, you're from Fargo, played ball at Fargo South High where you were, you know, a state champ there and everything and, and, and basketball, football, and tra track. Is that correct? That's correct. But, but yeah, we, uh, we had some, we had a really good couple classes. And so we were fortunate to be able to win some state titles and a couple different sports. So, uh, yeah, pretty fortunate that way. Right. So when you were, when you were in, in high school, and you graduated in 86, correct? Uh, 87, actually. 80, 87, okay. So you were a part of, I mean, while you were winning high school championships, you know, the Bison had just gotten done going back to back in 85 and 86, correct? So just tell me kind of how, you know, your experience as a high school recruit, obviously being from Fargo, North Dakota State at that point in time was was extremely successful in the division two era. Just kind of talk about, you know, that process growing up with, with all the success. Yeah. You know, that's, you know, that was one of the things, you know, back then, uh, all three high schools, Shanley, North, uh, South, all played on Dakota field. And so we, you know, felt, and for me, you know, that, that place always felt like home, you know, cause I played all my house high school games there and we got to see, you know, at times, you know, we'd be over there and, you know, we'd see the Bison players and such. But uh, but coming from Fargo South and we had back then with Dale Hurdle as the head coach and we were winning state titles. Uh, we kind of started there. And then after I left, they won quite a few more. Uh, and, uh, you know, it seems like to me, you know, you get a taste of that and then you then you see what the what NDSU was doing. So you want more of that. So um, when it came to the recruiting process, you know, you want to stay in a successful program and uh, there was no better uh, than the one right, right in town here, which is fortunate for my family. Uh, they were able to go to all the games and, uh, and again, it was comfortable for me from the standpoint, I'm playing on the same field I've been playing on since a, you know, since a freshman in high school, basically. So um, that part of it made it kind of easy. Uh, the only thing that was kind of a question mark was there was two things really was whether I was going to play football in college versus maybe baseball. And then uh, the style of offense they ran uh, back then was totally different than what I did in high school. Uh, I was an eye kind of guy that kind of tossed it to me and let me just kind of run around. Um, so, you know, the, you know, I didn't lift weights. I played four sports, so I didn't lift weights in high school. And so I was pretty scrawny as far as that goes. As, uh, and that, and um, so – you know, because you have to block and do all those different things in that offense, and uh, that was that was kind of foreign to me. Right. So how? So just touching on, you said you potentially were going to play baseball. Obviously, you ended up playing football. You know, you're the North Dakota Gatorade Player of the Year your senior season. Uh, what what kind of offers did you all have? Did you take any other visits, or was it you know you knew you were going to be a Bison? No, I took five visits. Um, actually, I, I I took a visit to UND. Believe it or not. <laughs> but uh, I also took a visit to Montana State. Uh, Earl Solomonson had just went out there. Um, and he knew of me, of course, because he was here. Um, and I also took visits at uh, Eastern, Eastern Illinois and then uh, Western Michigan. So, okay. uh, and uh, so, you know, I kind of, and then again, I, I, I struggled with the baseball football thing, uh, actually, because I, you know, baseball was really my favorite sport. And, uh, you know, the nice thing about baseball is, is uh, versus football, you know, football, you practice five days for one game and baseball, <laughs> once you start playing games, you don't do a lot of practicing. And I didn't love practice. And, uh, right. so, uh, and uh, so baseball was intriguing to me, but uh, at the end of the day, you know, that would, that would have been, have to have been a situation where I probably just go to the minors, you know, versus, you know, I talked to some scouts around and, uh, they were at our games and we hosted regionals our senior year. So there was a bunch of scouts around and talking to us and, uh, uh, 
you know, school, believe it or not, won out over trying to, because at, at some point or another, unless you make it big, you got to go to college and uh, you know, get that process started. And once you don't do that for a few years, it's hard to go back. So, right. so uh, um, get school paid for and uh, play football in North Dakota State at the end of the day ended up being the, the best choice for me, we felt like, and, uh, and that's what we did. Yeah, you, you mentioned how uh, uh, Salmson left to go to Montana State, and he had just finished winning back-to-back -back national championships. So, obviously, he, he had been recruiting you, I would imagine. And then when he left, that's when Coach Hager took over. How sure, was sure. that transition for you, you know, from whenever there's a coaching change in recruiting, it always gets a little bit uh, difficult. How, how, how did that influence your decision one way or the other? Well, fortunately, you know, back then, you know, they didn't really start the recruiting process too early. So right. I didn't really get – they weren't really down the road at all with uh, um, with recruiting as far as Earl goes. And uh, so I didn't have to worry about that as much. Um, you know, the big thing was for me um, and uh, in the recruiting process, um, for when it comes to Montana State in particular, um, you know, they're – their situation out there, they'd won a uh, – Casey Bradley's brother was a quarterback, in fact. They won an 84, I believe, FCS title. And uh, But uh, they, you know, they're the, the, you know, they had a beautiful campus, and, you know, they're close to the ski places. But, you know, not that I'm going to be doing a lot of skiing. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> but their, their facility situation wasn't great. Um, and, you know, again, uh, it's, it's a ways from home, and it was just a different, a different atmosphere. Uh, they were, you know, all the kids that they had on campus were all, you know, spread receivers and, you know, a lot of throwing. And Earl was going to come in there and try to win games with that personnel running a totally different offense. And I just didn't see, seem like – it didn't seem like it was going to be uh, – it was going to take a while for that to, to happen. Well, you, you, were, you had the uh, correct gut feeling because I think he ended up going like 15 and 40 – at yeah. Montana State, and it obviously wasn't extremely successful for him there. But right, and then yeah. and, and then Rocky, you know, Rocky, you know, it was kind of interesting. He, you know, uh, you know, it was wrote, written in the paper that uh, I was the local guy that had all the accolades, blah blah blah. Right. Well, the the uh, the, pay, the news guys were were putting you know, Ed or Ed Kolpak actually, and some of the read some stories that wrote some stories in the paper about you know. Rocky's first test is to see if he could keep me in town and all this. So they kind of linked us together right away. And, and uh, so you could, there was a little, uh, I don't know if you want to call it tension, but there was a little, uh, a little nervousness there when they uh, were talking to me and, and we had some good, uh, like I said, I took some visits at Western Michigan and Eastern and that was a, a family friend of ours with the head coach there, a guy my dad coached with at the University of Minnesota Morris back in the late seventies. And uh, I really was comfortable with him. And, uh, but uh, again, uh, he went to a situation that was maybe not the best either. So um, again, uh, NSU's, you know, success um, in the way they did things and the way they uh, operated, uh, there's a reason why we, our the program is what it is. Right. So let's just talk a little bit about that transition from high school to college. And then obviously with coach Hager coming in there, him being his first year was your, your freshman year when you're playing and, you know, you took that number 26, which was worn by Chad Stark, you know, another bison great. And they had just won two national championships and Rocky comes in there and, and the first season doesn't go so well. I mean, you're playing right away as a, as a young kid. I think you were either first or second, uh, rush, leading rusher on the team right away. I, th I think maybe second behind Doug Lloyd, if I remember right. Um, but right away, you, you know, you guys, you don't have that tremendous success. What was that season like for you? Well, it, it, it was tough. Um, you know, the senior outgoing senior class was big for one thing, a lot, a lot of numbers, and they were really good. Yeah. Uh, when you start talking Jimmy Dick and Todd DeBates and Tyrone Braxton and yeah, you know, two-time I mean, two Super Bowl champ. Yeah, I mean you got names and names and names, and uh, so um, in the junior class, which was two B seniors that that '87 year, was a small class, and uh, of the guys that were there, 
uh, most of them had had, you know, ACLs or, I mean, they were banged up too. So they played a lot of football in the last four or five years. So it was just uh, one of those deals. And we started the season and it started again, you know, right in fall camp, uh, people started getting hurt, especially, you know, some of the senior leaders. Uh, that, that's why I had to play right away as a true freshman that, you know, probably wasn't physically really ready to as far as the beating and all that, although I did not get hurt that year. So only year I didn't get some sort of injury, <laughs> believe it or not. But, uh, you know, that was a tough year. And, uh, you know, you know, Bentram leaving, you know, we had the quarterback situation with Sim Dorn and uh, Brian Owen. And that was one of those things where, you know, there were some questions there and who should be playing and how that goes. And, but anyway, you know, the, at the end of the day, the NCC is tough. And uh, there was no, I mean, there was no weeks off. And, uh, and uh, we started the season off at Northern Michigan and we lost. They had a fine team as well. I believe they got in the playoffs. They beat us barely, but, uh, you know, on a road, at the road game. But, uh, you know, that was a tough year. But again, I think it set the stage for the next couple couple of years. You know, we put a, put a wooden plaque up in the weight room and the uh, winter workouts is six and four was our record that year. And uh, after winter workouts, that, that plaque was not destroyed. And uh, 88 season came along and things were a lot better. Yeah, you guys end up going 14 and 0, uh, undefeated obviously with, with another national championship. And, and you mentioned, you talked about uh, Sim Dorn a little bit. He, he's a year older than you, correct? Correct, but ended up in the same class. Oh, okay. So he redshirted, yeah, he redshirted Ben from senior year. Okay, I see what you're saying. So, so he ends up in that 88 season, he ends up being the starter. And obviously he has a tremendous year. You have a tremendous year. And the, you know, you guys get another national championship. So what, what, what do you think the biggest, I mean, obviously when you have a coaching change, it's difficult year one. I mean, it's almost, I mean, when you look at what NDSU has currently done, it's almost just remarkable, right? I mean, it's unheard of. It's never right. been done before. So, yeah. but so how, so that trans, that first year transition bumps in the road that's almost to be expected in most circumstances. What was the biggest difference for you in that transition to, to winning the Natty that second year? Well, I think, it's, I think it's personal. Uh, you know, the, uh, the of uh, the offensive line that year was, you know, favor, Illa Kanan, Matt Tracy. I mean, basically three all Americans in the middle guard, center guard guard. We had good tackles, uh, Brian Johnson and, and Carl Hopple. And, uh, and then Gallo was our tight end. So we are, we were really good up front. And those guys had all been over 300. They were like 310 the year before. They all dropped down to around 295 to 300. So they were much better. Um, not that they weren't good the year before, but they were way better this, this, uh, in 88. Uh, you know, myself, Doug Lloyd was a senior. Um, you know, Jeff Johnson was a senior. Len Kreshman was a senior. You know, Snuffy on defense, we had Snuffy and Charlie. And uh, we had a lot of senior guys uh, in, uh, up front, uh, Matt, uh, Paul Lenz. I mean, we had a solid team. There wasn't a weakness, really. And, uh, and we were a year older, and uh, the coaching staff was a year more experienced as, uh, with what they were trying to do. Um, nothing really changed. I think the first year was more personnel and injuries. You know, we just weren't very deep. Uh, in 87, uh, we had several injuries at key positions and, uh, we just didn't have enough horsepower to, to, to you know, we lost, you know, you know, we're six and four, we, every game we lost, of course, was really close. Um, but, uh, there was really only one game that we really didn't have a shot at. And, uh, and, uh, and that was, I think down in Omaha or something, I can't remember where it was, but the bottom line was, is, uh, everything, everybody, I think was rededicated a little bit and, uh, ready to go a little more yeah did, what was your guys's you know off-season conditioning and and workouts like you know I know you mentioned you didn't really work out in high school that's not so much the case anymore but even you know when when we were getting recruited a ton I don't think it was the strength and conditioning wasn't nearly as implemented at the high school level even as it is now just being 10 years removed right um you know you know we had coach bliss you know it was a lot of bench clean squat you know, that, that kind of thing. Um, my off season though, I, I was, I was one of the first pre people to go to back when it was called for peer uh, sports medicine. He started the treadmill workouts. I was one of the first five people to do that with, uh, 
Oh yeah, that's it's acceleration more, now, correct? Yeah, that's what. Yeah, for period, I'm under acceleration, okay. and then it turned yeah, into yeah, yeah. Like, you got bought out, whatever it turned into. But uh, you know, back in so I I would come, I came back after in between my freshman and sophomore year, uh, you know, ten pounds heavier uh, than I was in '87, um, and I was a lot faster. Um, of course, a lot stronger because I actually started lifting weights, and 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 you know, it was interesting though. You know, I still wasn't where I needed to be, and I found that out in the you know in the Mankato game where I separated both my shoulders, and uh, so after between my sophomore and junior, I really got bigger and stronger, and uh, added another ten pounds. So I was over two hundred pounds by the time I was a junior, and that was needed, especially in that offense. You just can't. It's just it's just if you're not running the ball, you're running into somebody, and it's a you take a pretty pretty good beat, and you're two hundred pounds. And back then, the linebackers were all two thirty. In 240 some cases and there's some big dudes you're trying to load block is it's it you know it's like running into a wall Tony talk about talk about the style of offense you guys ran you know back in the day obviously uh some people have an I idea or concept of, of what you guys ran it's it's, it's much different uh today where it's all spread out and wide open and there's athletes all over, all over the field now you talk about big you know, big giant linebackers you know how did you guys attack teams with the offense you guys had well we had uh we ran a split back beer um and that, and we ran about seven different formations. So we, we did some end balance, twins, tights, um, very little motion. But uh, the big thing was, is we attacked the five technique. And, uh, you know, you know, a, a typical call, would, you know, some, you know, we ran running backs in and out. So a typical call would be, uh, you know, twins, twins right auto. Okay. Well, that means we're going to line up in twins right. And uh, the quarterback's going to call the play. And uh, the play was going to be whatever number he calls out. If there's a five technique somewhere, we're, we're running 44 or 45 zone at that five technique. If he slants, he's going to pull the ball. There's a lead, you know, there's a dive back and a pitch back. And then we're going to go from there. If, you, if they line up in like an odd formation where they're, uh, or an even formation where there's three techniques, we can run that same play at the three technique. You know, again, if he slants, uh, we're giving it if he if he stretch actually if he slants where he's uh he's pulling it and i'm i turn the lead back turns into a blocker if he stretches we, we kind of scoop behind him and, and hug it tight and go off the guard's butt so that was our goal was to get the you know the run at the five technique and then you know if they sold out you know we did throw here and there but everything was called 95 percent of the plays were called at the line of scrimmage either a, a zone check or a, or a check an actual play was called and they would check it red or black, red to the right, black to the left. And uh, so a typical play would be a pro right zone check. So whatever color he'd call, that's what we'd do. It was very simple. We ran, a, we ran basically about nine plays out of seven formations. And it's basically, here's what we're doing. Stop it if you can. Because everybody knew what we're doing. They just didn't know. They just couldn't stop it, really, for the most part. You know, I think we averaged 300 yards rushing a game or something like that. It's so remarkable how how simple from an offensive standpoint, you know, veer triple option teams are, and just how outrageously difficult they are to defend. You know, from a yeah. defensive standpoint, it's crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. And here's the thing that's funny about it. Is it's insane. It's insane. And here's the thing that's funny about it. You know, you guys. You know, you, you know, Cole. You saw. You know, Georgia Southern and all that. Um, yeah. The thing about it is, you know, these teams kind of knew. And we, our film study and our, and, our, and I, I, I was on the other side of it. I coached the running backs in 92, came back. And uh, we spent hours, I'd be there till two in the morning getting all this, the break up, breakdowns and trying to, all right, in first and 10, we're doing this. And, so, you know, here's how they line up. Here are their tendencies. In tendencies on third and short, here's their tendencies. Well, we'd come to the game and nobody would ever do that. They, they, they had a whole week. I'm sure they game plan for us in the summertime. But they, we'd come to the game, and they would do anything that they did on film up to leading up to that game. So then we'd make the adjustments, and that's where our coaches, I think, were good. And I think that's where they're good right now. Uh, it's the same thing now than, as it was then. Our coaches' adjustments were right on point. And, uh, you know, we ran into a game uh, uh, playoffs against Millersville where they ran double four eyes. And uh, double four eyes, double two eyes. We'd never seen that before. And it broke all our rules. There was no three technique. There was no five technique. 
in the first play of the game, Doug Lloyd was the lead back. He thought he was uh, uh, it was a pull rate, and Sim Dorn was giving it. And they f- we fumbled the ball in the 18 yard line, and they had the ball. And uh, we made that adjustment though on the sideline. It took us about a two series to figure it out, but uh, we finally got it figured out. And uh, it, you know, but it took us a while. And uh, and uh, but that, again, something they'd never shown before, and then that was typical of a. How long did it? What's that? Oh, you cut out. He must have. Is he, Cole, for those that are listening, Cole's practice, but I'll just ask him. Yeah. So Tony, how how did the you know how do you develop your you know, I guess with your quarterback, you know how how do you guys see the same page? You know how many reps in practice you have to work with a new quarterback? You know how hard was it to develop that relationship of when to give, when to pull? You know what, how he sees the game, how he sees where the three three technique, five technique is, and how he wants to call the game. Yeah, that, that that that's a great question, Cole. Because, you know, uh, I adjusted ba- based on who was playing. Occasionally, you know, we'd bring in some younger guys early in the year, especially. But, you know, that's all we did in practice over and over and over hundreds of times is ran the same thing, and it's all it was all mesh points, and it was all, you know, I for me personally, I tried to learn the we came, broke the huddle and they lined up. I, I would look, I'm like, I need to know what he's going to call. So then I I'm ready for it. So antici- anticipation is the key to everything when you're doing this. Cause if that guy, you know, and you got to know the guy you're playing against too, but when that guy's slanting hard, I mean, you, when that five technique slants, now I know I got to get around and block that linebacker for to make this play work. And uh, so that was, you know, you got to do that. It, it, it's a split second thing, but again, you're right. It, it does take time to learn each quarterback's. Uh, you know, it's, it's like it's, uh, it's like a pressure thing, and the same thing with the quarterbacks. They they have to learn these running backs. And we try to get it the way they coached it. They try to get it so everybody would kind of do it the same way. You don't want to latch onto the football, right? You know, if, if he puts it in your stomach. You don't necessarily latch onto it. You got to kind of feel his hands leaving you, or you got to feel him pulling that ball out of there. If you latch onto it, that's when you get stuck on your elbow and your next, the next step you take, the ball's laying on the ground. And, uh, you know, we did have, you know, no doubt about it. We had our share, uh, you know, where it happened, but it, you, it happened a lot less than you would imagine. How was, how was practicing against your own defense, you know, from a fall camp spring ball standpoint, I know, Coach Polisak would always talk about, you know, they give us the hardest looks, you know, when, when we were at NDSU and, and, you know, transitioning from a player to, to a GA at NDSU, I couldn't agree more. And, and NDSU's offense prepares NDSU's defense so well for anything that they're going to see during the upcoming se- season outside of maybe, you know, some spread four verts all the time, pack chucking it all over the place. But if you're going, if you're NDSU's defense going up against what you guys were running, it was probably a little bit difficult for them because they probably didn't see it a ton during the season. Well, they, they saw some, but the thing is, is it was the, to put it in two words, it's typically miserable <laughs> because they, you know, cause we, like I said, we didn't run too many plays, so they knew, they knew if they lined up with the five technique that they, we were running at it. They knew that they've seen it a thousand times, so. You know, those guys are be sprinting. So we try to do some different things. Um, but, yeah, uh, you know, it didn't take long for those guys under spring ball, ball camp even to figure out that, uh, you know, where people were going to be uh, at any given time. We had good players there, too, you know, Ken, you know, Snuffy and Kenny Clark coming up at you, and you had to be aware of where they were. And uh, so, yeah, it was uh, – there was some head knocking going on for sure. And then did, know, did the coaching still, staff, did they ever – uh, scout each other like, hey, uh, did your offense ever, you know, not run the veer for a couple series so that defense could get a look? Or did the defense ever do something that they normally wouldn't do that maybe you guys saw a ton in the conference? No, no. You you know, the big, the, 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 no, and, and the big thing with that is, um, and I think that's been really good about this program is uh, we are who we are. We're going to do what we're going to do. And, uh, and, you know, we're worried more about ourselves than, than the other guys. You know, we need to execute what we're doing, and that's what we're going to do. And uh, 
and we're tr we're trying to do what we do the best we can. So no, we didn't we didn't ever do any of that. Uh, you know, we had good guys, uh, good GAs, and uh, running scout squads, and that's what scouts are there for. And uh, you know, you know they're gonna run they're gonna run Mankato's or Northern Michigan's offense, but or defense. So no, none of that. Right. So so after your sophomore season, you guys had obviously just won a national championship. Going into your junior season, you guys fall a little bit short. I think you guys were an eight-win team. Uh, I believe you lost in the quarterfinals to Jacksonville State. It was a tight one, if I remember right. Uh, what, what was kind of the, the big thing, I, you know, going from undefeated to a three-loss season? Yeah, that was tough. Again, a big senior class moves out. Um, we had to fill some big positions, especially in the old line. And, uh, again, the other part of that season, again, uh, you know, no excuses, but injuries. I mean, myself, Sim Dorn, Kenny Clark, and Phil, even Phil got hurt for a while. Um, we, when we played uh, Jacksonville, we were down to our scout squad linebackers. <laughs> we had seven linebackers out. So it was pretty ugly, but you know, we should have won that game. In fact, you know, those, that's the year that I'm just, you know, I just, I th yeah, okay, we won our sophomore and senior year, but uh, I, I still look back at that one. If we win that game, I think we win the whole thing. But, uh, uh, you know, that's what happened that year. Uh, we had a good good squad. It's just we, again, didn't have quite the depth that the handle. I don't think any team did to handle that many injuries, especially at the linebacker position, which is very vital in our defense. Uh, you know, we're playing, you know, we're playing a 4-3 back then, or 5-3. Five, five, or five two kind of thing, but uh, actually a three four. But you know, it's just uh, you know, it was tough. You know, when you're, you're getting down to the scraping the bottom of the barrel, basically. I mean, those guys are, you know, those guys are all okay players. They just weren't as good, and they weren't as experienced as the other guys. And uh, that's just it shows up in the, you know Jacksonville State. I mean, they ran a wishbone. They were uh, they had a really good quarterback, but uh, you know. We should we should have won that football game, but oh well. And, Talk uh, about that game a little bit, because well, I'm not as familiar with the details. Well, the, the, you know, we went down there, and uh, they uh, they uh, their defense was really good. Uh, Eric Davis was their corner, one of their corners. I mean, he was like a all end up being all pro in the NFL, pretty much. I mean, or a pro a Pro Bowler anyway. He was a heck of a corner. They had really fast guys. The one thing they did their their field was interesting. Uh, their stadium was big. Uh, their field was like this clay base and it's really crowned. And uh, the, it was funny, it rained there a couple of days before we'd gotten there. We went a day early. I think we got there a Thursday. And uh, our cheerleaders went over and were uh, practicing over there. And they were, they were one, they came back to the hotel and they were wondering why, they like, why, were the, why do you suppose there was guys out there with fire hoses? There were fire hoses in the field. So to, to try to make a cut it was like playing on trying to catch a grease pig you could, I mean you could not it was it's clay and it's just slick and uh, I don't know if that was on purpose or not but it seemed pretty purposeful but anyway they they got up on us a little bit and uh, but we can't we, we fought back and uh, we ended up losing like 21 to 17 we just kind of ran out of time at the end uh, as the old famous saying because if I had more time we would have won <laughs> but uh, no they <laughs> They, they had a really good, they had a really good football team. In fact, I, the, the one thing that was really disappointing was uh, they ended up going to the national championship game that year to play Mississippi College and down in Florence, Alabama, where it's been was played for many years. And it snowed five inches that morning. And uh, <laughs> you think it would have been a psychological advantage of <laughs> five inches of snow for the North Dakota boys? That would have been awesome. But uh, so we had to like a home game. Yeah, no doubt, it would have been awesome. How was um, how how was home field advantage? You know, back then when teams had to come up to the tundra and play outdoors in the playoff in the in the, in the playoffs, it was uh, it was marketable. It was it was noticeable, especially you know a lot of times we we get to the semifinals of the quarter. You know, we see a California school, you know, Cal Davis, Cal Poly, and uh, you know even Pittsburgh State came up from Kansas one year. You know, for us, it was great. It was 30 degrees, slight breeze. You know, we were in T-shirts, and they were just – they were all huddled up in their 
they're in our they built little corrals, heater corrals, and they were huddled up in there trying to stay warm, especially the especially the receivers. <laughs> I can't imagine some of those even now, I mean, if we can move some of them out to the to the Dakota field, oh how, how some of these teams, especially now with how much spread there is and everything and North Dakota State would just run A-gap power. And <laughs> well, that was the other thing. I mean, I remember one playoff game, there was like a 35-mile-an-hour northwest wind. You know what that wind is like. And, uh, I mean, it's, I mean, you know, the, this number one passing attack comes in there. They had no chance. No chance. And, you know, you can't throw the ball in there. Even going with the wind is hard, hard to throw as it was against the wind. So, you know, yeah, it's just, you know, for our offense, it was perfect. How much did you? Uh, hard, you can go, Cole. How hard was that playing surface of Dakota Field? I, I know I, when I first got here, the old the old turf was still on there. They hadn't redone the the facility yet, and it, it wasn't fun to even walk on. What was it like playing on there? I mean, it, it had to be just a hard as a rock at that time of year. Well, you know, when I was when I was a junior in high school, is when they they changed that. The turf you should have seen it before that. <laughs> you can imagine <laughs> how bad that was. It was the turf that you, you saw, although it was old and beat up. When it first put in, it was not too bad, but uh, they said it was non-directional. It ended up being directional, and uh, that was one of my advantages uh, running on it. I knew which way to cut where I could I could I had to shorten my step or I could lengthen my step. And uh, but you know, yes, it was cold. Oh, it was hard, especially in November, late November. And and uh, I remember one game we played uh, coldest. I, one game I got. I mean, I was frozen, and. Uh, uh, it was against August, Augustan, I believe. I remember because that padding was probably an inch thick or two inches thick, and I put I put my foot into the into the ground, and the moisture came up, and it looked like a reverse turf shoe, and it froze within about twenty seconds of me doing that. You could see like fo frozen footprints all over the place. It was crazy. It's crazy it to hear this, Cole. How spoiled we were. We had the one practice <laughs> that everyone you know, in our kind of age talks about, and we all remember, and that was before Montana State in 2010 when we were out there. And now imagine just doing that every day. We were so spoiled. That would, that would have been miserable. I, I, I mean, I would have got it done, but I wouldn't, I didn't like practicing out in the cold. Um, yeah. I remember Montana State week, they were like, oh, any of you, they're a dome team. They can't, they can't come play us in the cold. I'm like, we live in North Dakota. Like, I'm pretty sure we're used to six degree weather. We'll be all right. And uh, yeah, we had that one blizzard practice out there that wasn't a lot of fun. But game after game and practice after practice, practice after practice, credit to you guys for doing that because uh, having that dome was nice. And now they got that practice bubble at, and, and soon to be practice facility up in the NDSU. It's a it's a different game now for those boys. No doubt. Yeah, you know, I remember I'll never forget one practice we had. We did it under the lights for some reason. I think it was because of finals. Maybe it was a playoff deal. Uh, we we were we went late. I think it was because of finals. And uh, we had the guy, the sweeper was out there. And uh, it was snowing so hard that he would sweep one half of the field and then we'd move on that half. And then by the time he was done sweeping the other half, we'd have to move back to where he was because the other part of where we were was getting so full of snow. <laughs> it was pretty, pretty. I had one day or two, and I think it was that same practice where both my hamstrings so seized up. I couldn't even stand upright. So I had to run in the locker room, not run. I had to wobble into the lock locker room and put sweatpants over my pads for my, for, I don't know what happened, but my hamstring just got frozen or something. It was like, uh, it was, it was, I've never had that happen before. It was kind of crazy. Did that uh, 2015 national championship win over Jacksonville State, did that mean something a little extra to you, getting that revenge? Uh, definitely did. Definitely awesome. did. I don't like those guys. They, you know, the funny thing is about those guys, Coach Burgess was their coach, and I think they named the field after him uh, down there now, or the stadium maybe, I don't know. But uh, he told he, – coach, coach came back and said uh, when they met with the officials the night before, he goes, hey, one last thing, bring a box of flags. Because those boys would chatter and chatter. And, I mean, you wouldn't believe how much trash they talk. And they were feisty and punching you. And it was, and there's some bad hits. They knocked Simdorn out uh, just on a cheap shot. And uh, so, yeah, yeah, those boys, uh, I, did, I, I enjoyed watching that one immensely. Well, things haven't changed a ton from then. Uh, a funny story, I'm sure you know, I don't know, maybe not. But uh, before, before we walked out in 2015, 
their one their Alabama transfer. I, f- I forget exactly who it was. One of their D linemen uh, met met up with Joe Hag and was talking crap to him. And Coach Kleiman kind of had to hold everybody back. And it was like, what is going on? And then Wallaceac <laughs> came out and ran. 22 personnel, no huddle down the field, first drive of the game, and Joe Hag took the guy like 20 yards the other way. I remember that like, drive, and I remember I remember hearing that story about they were in the huddle. I was like, if they go in the tunnel with these guys, it's going to be noisy. <laughs> Just don't do it. But yeah, uh, yeah I, that that first series was awesome. They didn't know what they're all. Everybody was on skates. Everybody, and you're exactly right. That that tunnel in Frisco was really small, and they walked out first, and we were standing there and. They had some guys that didn't didn't want to go out to the field. They wanted to to fight or something. I don't know. But transitioning yeah. from that junior season, uh, obviously your senior season, you you kind of get sweet redemption. You go fourteen and zero again, win another national championship. Uh, you know, uh, one of our coaches, uh, Fuxi, he he was playing with you that senior season. He was a young buck uh, yep. on that old line. Talk, talk about that a little bit. Yeah, Fuxi was good, man. Technical man. Uh, really good, good player. Um, that team, that team was, that was one of the better offenses. I think the one thing that happened is, uh, uh, the rest of division two got a little sick of us, uh, winning so much. So what they did is they made it, uh, spring ball, no pads. So, uh, so what we did is we put in a three-step passing attack and, uh, so we added that, and we also added some other wrinkles, uh, a broken bone where it puts me in the eye formation. It came in handy because uh, um, the first game of our, our senior year, our, our quarterback, Chris, was suspended. Uh, so we had, a, we had young guys playing, Arden Beachy and uh, Chris, Chris Carlson, a quarterback. So what that allowed us to do, and we had senior running backs, and what that allowed us to do is uh, instead of me being split back, I would, I would, I'd line up like a, like a tailback would like in this offense and he just turn and toss it to me and let me run kind of like I did in high school. Right. And uh, that worked out nice. And of course it was a new look for them. It, it made them do some things on the blackboard at the, on the sidelines. But the other thing we, uh, Hammersmith had put some different things in like a fly motion thing that get us a little more leverage on the pitch on the pitch routes. Um, so we were able to put in some new, new wrinkles, uh, that uh, created issues with uh, with team. Now they only had to defend the veer, but now they had to defend a three three step passing attack that we didn't really have. We 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 had some things, but we we added. It, it was always in the playbook. It was just stuff we just never really went to because it was just there's only so much time in the day, right? So uh, uh, we had some good receivers. Uh, T. R. McDonald was a true freshman, and that guy. I mean, Tatino you know, Grace, kind of, but, huh? Tatino Grace High School. That's yeah, right. You had to, yeah, Gatorade Player of the Year or something like that. But uh, yeah, I mean that guy. He's kind of like an RJ before RJ. The guy had or Cole Heckendorf maybe. The guy, if it was in his vicinity, he was going to catch it. I mean, he some of the catches he made were just ridiculous. And uh, so he was a good player. Uh, uh, again, we we got to be you know we had a 12 man senior class and we had a really good junior class. And uh, yeah, we our offense was really high powered that year. Uh, as far as scoring and uh, yards, so uh, and our defense was good. I mean, Wash and and uh, it Wash and uh, Phil Hanson was a senior that year, so uh, you know he was he wasn't bad. <laughs> right, and obviously you had some. I mean, I can just hear it in your voice still talking about that Jacksonville State game. You guys had some added extra motivation, and when you look at the scores of that of your senior season, I mean, every one of them was completely lopsided. You guys just ran through everybody. Uh, it was a complete domination. Yeah, like again, like I said, you know, we we had some we had some firepower that year. Chris, of course, was a senior quarterback. You had a senior quarterback, uh, that always helps. Um, and uh, you know, we did again. We were doing some things that you know that teams had to practice for a lot more than what we were just in years past. And that's what the thing you know. I don't think a lot of people understand that uh, when you play a you know, that, you know, back then it's regionalization. So the first round of the playoffs is always somebody from your conference, usually, I mean, more times than not. And uh, for instance, this year, you know, we played up Illinois state for a second time in the same year, right? That's tough. Yeah. That's tough, especially when you handle the first game. And so um, that's why I get frustrated when, you know, okay, we're playing South Dakota state again. 
but you know, I'm sure they're just as frustrated because we're playing the Bison again, but because we seem to lose every time. But again, it's really hard to play a team a second time, especially you know, you know that team's good, you know. So in you know whatever happened in that first game really doesn't matter, but it does matter, and so it's it's like uh, you know it's it's really difficult. So you know for us to uh, manage that and uh, uh, in you know, like northern I think northern Colorado that year was it was the the bounce back team we had to play. And that was a, you know, we beat them 30 something, the teens in the first game out there. Well, we beat them 17 to seven in the playoffs. So you can just see right there, um, you know, the difference. Yeah. There's so many similarities between, you know, your time. And then now, you know, you talk about how tough your conference was and, and it was a meat grinder and, you know, the Valley is now, and, and you said it, you know, perfectly every year, it's almost like, all right, what Valley team are we going to have to go through or, some years it's been which two Valley teams? Yeah, Northern uh, in the Iowa, playoffs. You know? Yeah, South Dakota State. Um, but, but, yeah, like you said, you guys managed to find a way to get it done. And you guys won the Natty your senior year. I, I, the score was 51 to 11. That game was crazy. <laughs> so, we had, so the crazy thing about that, first of all, we had opened the season with that team, Indiana University of Pennsylvania. Never heard of, you know, we played some Pennsylvania conference teams in the past, Millersville and Edinburgh and, things like that and uh, they had a hot shot quarterback and a really good receiver really good Jai Hill and uh, they were a good team in fact uh, Signetti his dad the coach that got JMU's dad was the head coach so uh, um, so we played them for the second time and it was funny we did some press stuff you know leading up to the game and their linebacker was there and uh we were talking a little bit. Yeah, it's not going to be the same this time. I was like, well, dude, we didn't we didn't have our quarterback the first game, man. <laughs> but you know, you know, we go in. Uh, they, you know, the thing that the mistake they made is they lined up in the every time we ran twins, they ran the same formation. Every time we ran pro, and you know, they they they, they line up in the same formation defensively every time, and that's just a mistake. You can't do that. But the, the other part of it was, you know, we had ten sacks that game. And uh, it was 14-11 at halftime. We ran 16 plays in the third quarter, and we scored five touchdowns. So Adjustments. That just doesn't happen. Right. Well, you know, that just doesn't happen. Oh. Talk about your, your rivals. You know, what, what were the main rivals back then? Well, University of North Dakota would be one. They were a rival just because, you know, they're in our conference, and they're 80 miles down the road. Now, they weren't real good. Uh, until they started to get better uh, a little bit after I got done. But uh, Mankato was a big one. Uh, they were tough. Runkle, the Coach Runkle there did a good job with those fellas. And those boys, win or lose, you're going to have some guys limping home. And, uh, and then St. Cloud uh, wasn't bad. Uh, uh, they had some really good, yeah, really good running back at one time. And they actually in 87 beat us. Or no, in 89. 89 or 89 my senior my junior year they'd be actually beat us that's uh uh we're down to our third we had to pull a red shirt on the quarterback that game uh it was kind of crazy You're running that veer people's quarterbacks get hit now well Simdorn didn't play and then Craig Guerin comes in and the guy throws him on the ground he breaks his elbow his elbow is pointing the other direction his arm is pointing the other direction he broke his elbow and turned him into a receiver after that <laughs> but uh, we had to pull the shirt off of Chris Carlson Tony, some of these teams you guys played, uh, uh-huh. do you think they could make the jump to FCS to the Mankato and Duluth, you know, maybe you know, that, that are in that conference now, you know, make that jump and make that old conference, you know, the new FCS uh, of the world? I know some fans would love it. Some fans would hate it in, in, in Bison world. Well, I, yeah, I, I think um, I think the issue would be, I think they could football program-wise, the way they're the way things look at Mankato right now, and you know Duluth fell back a little bit this year, but man, Mankato's tough, and uh, they they recruit the heck out of kids. The only the, the the there's two common there's a common denominator that both those schools have that make it really hard to make that move. We all know what that is, right? Division one hockey. Hockey. Yeah. It's just too much mm-hmm. money, and uh, UND's finding out what that's like. Uh, they're they str- they're struggling that way. Uh, they're they're trying to get on top of it now, but uh, that that's a big burden. Uh, St. Cloud State just cut their football program because of it. They St. Cloud cut football. Cut football. 
I didn't hear that. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah big hit. You know, so I, I coached in that, the current conference, the Northern sun for two, two seasons and St. Cloud state was tough. We got, we got, we got the first win on them my last year there that they'd ever had. And, um, yeah, they, they just, they cut it. You drove them out of there, huh? <laughs> yeah, but it's funny. It's it's hockey. Like, I, I always joke around with UND fans. You know, I really don't care. Like, like you yeah. you had a, a really – you had a rivalry. You know, Cole and I, we didn't. You know, we didn't have a rivalry with, with UND, so that hatred's not there. I mean, it's there in the community when you talk to people. But for us as players, we, we, we feel a little bit like we missed out on that. But when when they won Division One hockey in 2016, I believe – that, that Monday, they cut their baseball program. Like, you don't – a football team wins a national championship. The whole athletic department's jumping for joy because that's a lot of revenue. Right. You know, it makes it tough. Yeah. Well, you know, the thing about it is a couple things based on what you – you know, back then, too, the, yeah, there was a rivalry, but, you know, but we were in the middle of a 13-game. You know, when I played, it was – I think we won seven, eight, nine, ten in a row. And so – Again, a definition of a rivalry is a there's a give and take, right? Well, I knew it was there, but it was more fans. It was more vitriol with the fans than it was the players. I'm buddies with guys who went to UND and played football against them, but it, it was more the fans. It's just the venom was just un, unbelievable. Now I didn't enjoy I didn't enjoy walking through the fans at UND and get snowballs fired at me either. But that's just part of it, I guess. And then when you're talking about UND and, and their athletic department and how things are ran up there, I didn't, I didn't know this until like last year, but you know, the Ralph gets foundation gets 52% of everything. So football gate, basketball gate, volleyball, anything, they get 52% of ticket sales, period. That's gotta be tough on a, a football program that all that money is going over to the hockey foundation guys. Uh, I don't understand that, but that's the deal they cut for their hundred million dollar skating rink. Yeah. So it's, it's beautiful. Wild. It is beautiful though. <laughs> yeah. I've been, I've only been there for a uh, Eric church concert a couple of times, but never oh, been to good. an actual hockey game. Yeah, I've been to a few. It's nice. Yeah. It's interesting too. I remember when we were playing, I get the years mixed up, but we, we finally played UND non-conference, I think in 2015. Yeah, and so. I was out to eat with Coach Polisak. You know, he used to always take care of the GAs. And mm -hmm. we were talking. It was game week. I think it was Thursday before we played them. And, and he, he specifically was like, I think we were talking. And I was like, ah, it doesn't seem like that big of a deal. And you know how Tim is. You know, he just takes him one little comment before he starts screaming at me. And uh, he was like, basically MF me and was saying how it's, a big, it's, a, it's not a big deal to you. It's a big deal to everyone in this community. And yeah. we, we lose this one. You figure, you'll figure it out real quick, you know, yeah. so it's interesting. Yeah, yeah, you can't lose that one. Uh, I don't think anybody was really concerned. But, you know, anytime you scrap it up, you know, anything can happen. So, right. yeah, I mean, there, I think there was a, a bit of a mismatch in that game. But, again, anything can happen. Anytime, you, you know, 60 minutes happens, anything can happen. So, that was, uh, how do you think they're going to – how do you think they're going to do in the Valley? Is, is it this year they come? Cool, you probably know. Yeah. Yep. This yeah, year. Year. yeah. Yeah, I think uh, uh, they're going to struggle a little bit um, on the front. And, and the, you know, they have some built-in advantages from the standpoint that Bubba and some of those guys have been in the Valley at other points in time. Uh, Personnel-wise, they're they're going to have to get stronger up front. Uh, they they got to find a quarterback. Uh, they got three guys in there, but they're all young. And uh, so, you know, if they can get their quarterbacks going, um, you know, but, you know, I think it's, I think down the road, it's going to help them from a recruiting standpoint, you know, from the standpoint that now parent, you know, when it comes to like a family situation where, okay, where are you playing? You're, you know, you're playing out in Sacramento this week. Well, we can't make that, you know, so th I think it's going to help them recruit the Midwest, um, because the footprint's going to be a lot more desirable for these folks. So we'll see. I mean, they, uh, again, they're second fiddle up there. And uh, that's all, that's part of the deal too. So that's, they got an 800 pound gorilla 80 miles south of them. And then they got another 45 pound gorilla, another 185 miles south of them. So, uh, you know, so that's, that's a tough deal for them. 
it's going to be tough for them to win the state. That's for sure in recruiting. Yeah, but then you look at Minneapolis too. I mean, you got to you got to try to fight off UNI, SDSU, USD. I mean, you know, the Western program, the Illinois programs are all in the cities area. I mean, they're you know fifth, sixth, seventh fiddle in, in recruiting, and the, the biggest hotbed you probably have to win to to be competitive in the valley, and that's probably the cities, Wisconsin, um, you know, Nebraska area, and they just they just don't have any ties anywhere to to go get players, and I, you know, I, I think they're going to respond. Yeah, that's their big struggle. For a while until they can find a system to compete in this conference. Yeah, I I, I agree wholeheartedly. Minneapolis is huge, and uh, you know they they're getting a couple kids out of the state, but I you know you know um, I don't think there's too many that have gone that that were our guys were super disappointed in uh, that they didn't get. So. Um, you know, the recruiting is the hugest piece. I mean, you know, you can't win without a good player. You don't have, you know, <laughs> he could be a great football coach, but if you don't have to play, tough. So after your senior season, you know, North Dakota State had just won their eighth Division II national championship. And then, and then they go on a little bit of a drought. And, and you, you were here, obviously, as, you know, a fan and everything. What, what do you think was the biggest reason for that? You know, they had successful teams. But you know they didn't reach that pinnacle again until 2011. Well, I think it was a combination of some things. I think um, the scholarship reduction in Division Two hurt us more than other schools uh, around here. Um, from the standpoint, we were getting kids from Wisconsin that were you know, you know, borderline guys that could have been up, could have been you know. You know the Doug Lloyd's and the Tyrone Braxton's and the Flint Flemings of the world. We weren't getting those guys anymore, and uh, so you know that's part of it, I think. And you know, you know the conference is tough. I mean, we were, you know I think there were some playoff runs there, um, but yeah, it was you know I think I think the people in the league got better. You know, we're seeing that now. I mean, we're we're forcing Valley schools to get better, uh, and we have been for the last I don't know how many years. And uh, you're seeing it. Look at South Dakota. I mean, they beat South Dakota State for the first time ever in Division One era this last year. You know, look at Northern Iowa, uh, even Southern Illinois now uh, is starting to get some kids in there that are they're starting to get the right kids. Um, I think they struggled a bit with Lennon and and uh, just he didn't connect. Um, but uh, yeah, um, yeah, that little drought there. Well, that was a big drought, actually, from our standpoint, uh, from our you know what we're used to. Um, but I think that's just sometimes that just happens. Um, but yeah, I think there was a couple factors in there. Right, and and they could have won, you know, in my opinion, uh, potentially two national championships when when they weren't eligible, you know, in that transition period when Coach Bowl got there. I think yeah. it was the. Uh, uh, 2005, 2006 season or 06, 07. Six and seven. Yeah. Where they went 10 and one, 10 and one. Um, you know, so definitely what, what is your impression been with how they've been doing the last decade? I mean, obviously it's pretty remarkable, but. I don't even, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if you can even really, I, you know, I don't know. I'm not, I don't know if I can even articulate it. Because it's it's so. When you start talking about you know three different head coaches, uh, four different, five different quarter. If you throw, I mean, you start throwing in the quarterbacks. In the you're starting with Walker, you go to Jensen, and you go to Carson, and you go to Easton, and now you got probably the maybe the best of them all is is still playing, and we got yet to be seen, you know. But he looks pretty good in my eyes, but. It's it's remarkable, and then the recruiting footprint keeps getting bigger, and but they're doing it the right way. Like they go into Frisco, but they say, you know what, we're not recruiting the whole area because you know it's like trying to needle and stack of needles, right? So they go, we're going to pick these 12, 13 schools. We're going to concentrate on those, and if we get one or two kids out of there each year, awesome. But it's in that's doing it smart, you know, going into Georgia, a few counties. And uh, you know, send uh, Buddha down there. You know, 
instead of trying to cover everything, just, you know, rifle it instead of shotgun it. You know, they're doing some smart things. And then, you know, uh, Coach Kramer is, I think, um, you know, my son's about to find out what that's like. <laughs> I don't know if he's ready or not. But, uh, you know, that guy, you know, you know, all from what – incredible. So – uh, there's then the, and again the administration and the, the support is there from the university and the, the fan base and everybody and the alumni and so it's 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 pretty remarkable to think in the last ten years that you know to win that much it's it's just not seems doesn't seem possible. Talk, yeah. talk about the recruiting process of, of going through it with your kid for people that don't know your kid committed to NDSU this last uh, re recruiting period. What was it like, you know, going on visits with him and, you know, heading up to UND on a visit and heading to other schools and obviously finally settling on uh, on North Dakota State? You know, it's, you know, for Ty, it's probably, you know, maybe it was felt some pressure to go there or not, or, hey, do I have a little up to my dad's shoes or, or, or not? That's a, always a tough situation. But talk about that whole process for, for your family. Yeah, you know, um, you know, you, India, you know, Ty's been going to the camp since before he was old enough. In fact, Paul said got him in. He's a year early. <laughs> he goes, he can come, but so he got to, he, he, he was pretty sad when Tim left actually, but, uh, but yeah, you know, the recruiting process, you know, NDSU, uh, you know, did a really good job and, you know, I tried to stay as uh, behind the scenes as I could, uh, you know, basically having conversations with Ty and saying, listen, I don't care who comes knocking, you got to be open-minded and, you know, again, he had some you know, he didn't, he wasn't for sure going to be a foot. He didn't, he wasn't sure about football at first anyway, but, uh, cause he, you know, he likes to he's a pretty good golfer and okay basketball player. And, you know, so overall pretty good athlete. So he didn't know where his opportunities were going to come. And then, you know, NDSU started talking to him more on a standpoint of a recruit versus just a, you know, a guy that was at camp. And, uh, and of course, Randy Hedberg's the recruiter. And of course, you know, living in town, you get to know everybody and, you know, we're, we're members out of the Oxo, so you get to bump into these guys. So you, you, you do build a bit of a relationship. But again, we went up to UND as well. And uh, I've known Bubba a long time. He coached on UND when I was playing. And, uh, and uh, we gave them a fair shake, uh, believe it or not. And, uh, you know, they wanted him to play corner. And they, you know, they, they gave him a great offer. And, uh, but at the end of the day, um, it did, even if I went to play at NDSU, um, I think to get an offer from NDSU uh, was made Ty's day, first of all. And you know, he's in the other side of that too. Cole is you know he's been you know he's been going to football games since he could walk, and so he kind of bleeds green and gold. And that's hard to you know that's hard. And you know Bubba, you know you know Bubba Schweiger. You know, he knew that, and uh, but they, you know, they gave their best effort, and uh, and uh, and then you know, in Iowa was another. You know, Tim was down there. We went down to their game day visit down there, and and Tim was, you know, and I loved Tim, and he's, you know, consider him a friend, and but he he didn't want to get in that situation where he was recruiting against NDSU, and from the standpoint, if if they offered Ty and, and he still went to NDSU, that would not look good to Iowa. <laughs> and uh so he was he was leery of that not to say he was going to offer him i'm just saying he you know he i think he was leery of that right yeah and and you know before when we were just talking about the coaching and everything what what did what did rocky you know mean to you and and that program well um rocky uh Rocky and Peggy, his wife, were actually host couples in my wedding. So I was really close with Rocky. Uh, like I said, I, I was kind of the, the his first base. I won't say his first recruit, but he was. The, I was the guy that he needed to get in town here when he first started, and we were kind of bonded at the hip after that. And uh, he, you know, the one thing I really appreciate about Rocky is he knew how to coach people. He he wasn't a coach you the same way he coached me. You know, he knew that, you know, where my buttons were and he would, 
you know, basically stay away from the buttons. And he would be, you know, those same, that button, that same thing might be different for you or another guy or the other guy. So, you know, he knew not to scream and yell at me. He just knew I wouldn't, if I, if he did that, I was going the other way. He, he figured that out immediately. And, uh, and I appreciate that because there's certain guys he had to scream and yell at every day. And uh, there's some guys he had to give up, you know, a little bit. And so that was one thing I really liked about him is uh, he, he was kind of a second father figure, even though I had his, you know, I was, my dad was right here in town, <laughs> but when you're in camp, my dad always told me when you're in campus, you're only five miles away, but you're really a million miles away. And I didn't realize what he was talking about until I was on campus. I was like, Holy crap. He was right. It's like a bubble, you know, whatever goes on in campus, you know, if you're not part of the school, you have nothing, you have no idea what's going on. So, um, that was always, I always had that uh, autonomy that way. So, but if I had to go home and get something to eat or get some clothes washed, I could do that too. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and, you know, we were talking a little bit about kind of the, the, the three head coaching changes, you know, in, in this most recent run for NDSU with Bull climbing and now coach Ants and, and Cole, I'd, I'd like to just hear your, your kind of thoughts on everything, but, you know, I know, I know, uh, Tony, you mentioned coach Kramer and any, any Bison player, he's probably the number one guy that they're going to talk about for being but, responsible for the success. Hey, before you go, Paul, you gotta, people got to realize this too. In that run in the 80s and up till 90, you know how many different head coaches won titles? Three. Solomonson, Dude. Morton, and Rocky. Yeah. Morton won in 83, right? Huh? Morton won in 83. 83, 84. No, they lost 84. Yeah. He, he won 83, he'd left, and then they lost the title game 84, and Solomon's in 85, 86, Rocky in 90, in 88. In 88 and 90. 90, yeah. Yeah, so think about that. So the similarities. Yeah, again, it's pretty it's wild. Fun. But, yeah, so so Coach Kramer is a staple. And then the other one, and we've talked about him. I mean, you've brought him up a couple times now, but it's interesting. It's Coach Polisek. I mean, you'd never hear so many defensive players – bring up an offensive coach for someone that completely impacted them in a, in a positive way, just not only on the football field, but in life in general, the work ethic and, and everything like that. Um, and then obviously coach Kleiman, when he got there in 2011, you know, he coach Hazleton had everything going in the right direction from a defensive standpoint, but coach Kleiman was, is not was, is, you know, pretty spectacular as well. This whole coaching staff was, was pretty unreal, and, and, and kind of what to touch on Tony's point there. You know, different coaches have, have come through this program, and and some done well, and some haven't. And I, I think it goes back to which which coach kind of buys into to the Bison culture. You know, which coach can put their ego aside and, and buy into something special, and you know, work with those players, and, and, and you know, work with the community, and, and, and grow something. You know, there's a reason why coaches come here and, and had success, and, and be able to go on to bigger and better things. And, and take what they, you know, learned here and, and move on with it. I mean, Coach Kleiman stepped down as a co-defensive coordinator, came to NDSU to be an assistant second assistant coach in the secondary, and is now the head coach at Kansas State. I mean, if that doesn't tell you about a guy that can put his ego aside, you know, and, and really devote to, you know, to the team, to the culture, to the community, and, and see what that can do for him is, is massive. I mean, Jamar Kane, who's at – Oklahoma now, you know, says, you know, NDSU taught him, you know, a ton. He wasn't here very long and, and guys like that, you know, it's, it's not necessarily the coach that comes in, you know, it's a coach that comes in and, and buys into that culture, keep that culture alive. We talk so much about family here at this, uh, at this school. And it, it, it's such truly a family. I mean, Tony, you know, we, we obviously never played together, but, you know, we, we, can, we can talk like we, we did, you know, we have so many stories to share with each other and we get along so well, we see each other all the time and, and the community that's created with this with this program, I think, is what makes coaches successful. That's why three coaches have come here and, and won so many titles in, in, in different eras. I, I think that's the biggest reason these coaches have success. Yeah, I agree wholeheartedly. And, I, and you got to give Craig credit. I think you, know, you think about the BFPA now, and and, uh, mm -hmm. and that all started Friday practice down in Frisco. You know, basically, in my mind, that's how this thing got started. And, uh, you know, him embracing the alumni and the, and uh, the alumni bracing the program the way we have, and uh, and and you're talking about, you know, the coach, you know, Kleiman is just unbelievable, and uh, just a gem of a guy, and 
and super smart and you know kept the things pretty much the same and uh, did it put his own little touches on it. And I think Matt's doing the same thing. Mm-hmm. You know, and, you, and, and uh, Joy, you talked about uh, Paul a sec. Now, that guy, you know, the, the, the passion and the fire, that's why it's, it is rare that a defensive, co- defensive players even, I mean, I, there's some defensive players that went through college and they, they couldn't tell you who the, the offensive player coaches were. And uh, so, you know, for him to touch that many people uh, on both sides of the ball, that way is, is pretty cool. And uh, it's a testament to you know, what he's doing down in Iowa and, and having more success down there as well. And you look, you know, you look at the coaching tree and, and where these guys are going and what they're doing is pretty cool. Uh, like you said, Jamar in Oklahoma and, and half the staff from the, you know, the K-State staff, all those guys. And then, uh, of course, Craig down in Wyoming with, and Fuxi's down in Buffalo, it looks like. And, uh, uh, so yeah, I mean, it's pretty, pretty awesome. Yeah, it's been, it's been, it is, like you said, it's crazy to watch the, the coaching tree expand and not only expand, but everyone seems to be having quite a bit of success in their own, in their own way. Uh, the last question that I have, and then Cole, you can wrap it up or you can ask an additional one is, is what, what does Bison Pride mean to you? Well, it's another one of those things that's hard to put into words. I think it's something that's inside of you. Uh, that's uh, instilled within you as you as you go through the program and it stays with you forever um, as far as I can tell you know it hasn't left my body I know that and uh, and I think you know it the, the the cool thing is it's different for everybody but I think it, there's 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 pillars there's pillars that connect them all to the that you know it may seem a little bit different for you than me or coal or whatever, but I think that the, at, at its foundation, it's the same. And, uh, you know, we're, you know, like, like Cole said, you know, he, you know, you get quite a bit, you know, shit, 20 years younger or 25 years younger than I am, but I feel like we, you know, we're, it feels like we're on, we're on the same team. You know, I, I'm around him and I see him around and you know, we're on a BFPA board together. And, you know, and of course I sat and watched play all those games and I, I pay attention. So I, some of those games are still in my brain. I can kind of remember what happened, and and uh, so all of that, and uh, and and I'll be interested to ask my son here in about five, three, four years, what he thinks, and how if he feels it, if, if he can. But it's really hard to put into words. But I, all I know, I think it's something that just kind of worms into your heart and your brain, and it just never leaves. And it's just this. It's it's it. Uh, Again, I no, I don't really even have the words for it. It's just hard. It's really hard to explain, but it's there. And uh, the success, you know, the success helps. But you know, it was still there back in the, you know, the two thousands, early to late nineties. I mean, we weren't winning as much. Uh, it was still there. Um, so, but uh, it's more. It seems like it comes to the surface a little more when you're dominating everybody. So, all the that it does. It's, I think it's really hard to put words to and whenever somebody asks me, it's, it's tough, you know, and obviously winning, you know, winning helps grow the culture, grow the community uh, around you, but uh, just being a part of that family is, is, is so, so great. We appreciate you joining us on the, on the podcast here talking about your time and uh, congratulations on your son, you know, committed to be a bison and I uh, can't wait to hear him on Saturday coming across the intercoms. All right. Well, appreciate you uh, getting them, trying to get them in shape as well here. He's, uh, <laughs> We're trying he put some. You put some weight on, but now you gotta you gotta be able to move. So thanks for you, thanks you boys for having me on.